Hi, my name is Johan Stefanovic. I'm from Microsoft Research. If I asked you what are the dominant storage technologies in the cloud, 10 years ago, your answer would have been flash, hard disk drives, and tape. Today, your answer would be flash, hard disk drives, and tape. We believe there's a massive opportunity for disruption in the storage landscape, and it's quite likely that the answer to this question may be different in a decade's time. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you about the unique challenges that are faced by storage at cloud scale, share some insights and observations from our years of experience here at Microsoft Research, and discuss the opportunity that lead us to believe that this disruption is on the horizon. There are three primary storage technologies in the cloud, flash, hard disk drives, and magnetic tape. These technologies were all invented before the cloud when they were designed to operate in a number of different consumer as well as enterprise environments. Now, because of their vastly different properties and performance characteristics, cloud providers offer different segregated storage tiers at different price points, each underpinned by a different technology. Flash stores the hottest data, that is data that has the highest IOPS and throughput requirements at a premium price. However, the majority of data in the cloud is stored on magnetic media, hard disk drives and magnetic tape. And yes, despite popular belief, tape is in fact not dead in the cloud. Natural consequence of this is that uh, you end up with a hierarchy of tiers that are ordered by data temperature, that is access rate. And these tiers have all been expanding massively over time. And this uh, expansion is primarily driven by exponential growth. By 2025, it's projected that around 175 zettabytes of data will be generated each year between the cloud and all the edge devices. And as you might guess, cost is a crucial concern. Providers have to cut costs in order to stay competitive. And hardware is a large part of that cost. In order to keep up with exponentially increasing storage demand without exponentially increasing costs, providers will only purchase storage whose dollar per gigabyte cost is also decreasing exponentially, which puts the burden on storage vendors to drive innovation and decrease costs in large volumes. Now, traditionally, cost decreases were driven by density increases. However, for some technologies, progress is becoming increasingly difficult. Every successful technology follows an innovation S-curve, as shown here. On the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have some metric of interest that captures the progress of the technology over time. For storage, this is typically something like gigabytes per dollar or IOPS per dollar. And there are three eras. In the era of ferment, there is very little improvement to the metric of interest because the technology is still in its infancy and its basic physics are still being understood. Once these basic mechanisms have been understood, the technology takes off and you get a period of rapid improvement to uh, the metric of interest. Often this is captured by some rule of thumb, like the capacity will double every three years or so. Finally, the technology reaches maturity and it's difficult to maintain improvements using the same mechanisms that were exploited during takeoff and the technology is set to roll over. Now this point is very interesting because a discontinuity can occur. If a new technology can come along and make enough progress to reach takeoff, it can quickly surpass the incumbent technology. So we think of the S-curve as a qualitative tool for understanding different technologies' life cycles. And what we want to understand is at which point are the incumbent storage technologies uh, likely to roll over. And what we found is that density alone does not paint the full picture. So in the paper, we have a much more detailed data-driven analysis, so I urge you to read that. But here, I'm just going to focus on the high-level trends that worry us going forward. We believe that flash is approaching maturity. Increasing the number of layers in a 3D stack results in linear density scaling, while increasing the number of uh, levels per cell brings only marginal density improvements. Decreasing feature size, which would result in the largest quadratic uh, density gains, fundamentally decreases flash endurance. And it's difficult, given where flash is now, to see how exponential growth can be sustained over the next decade. We believe that hard disk drives have already reached maturity, the rate of density improvements has stalled for over a decade. But the bigger problem is that given hard disk drives form factors and mechanical designs, the IOPS per terabyte will continue to drop as density increases, leaving stranded capacity in each unit. And for tape, uh, while it's unclear whether they've reached maturity for raw capacity, uh, the number of tapes shipped every year is decreasing. Tapes are a very niche shrinking market. In the past, there were six tape manufacturers on the market now that's shrunk down to only two, Fujifilm and Sony. For a cloud provider whose future growth depends on an external shrinking ecosystem, this is not good news. And it's unclear if the economic incentive exists to continue driving meaningful innovation in the tape ecosystem. So what does all this mean for the future of cloud storage? Could there be a disruption to the dominant storage technologies in the next decade? 
So up next, we're going to look at some of the unique properties and aspects of cloud storage design, as well as some of the opportunities for new technologies that are designed to be cloud first. Storage tiers in the cloud are virtualized. Customers buy SLAs, not a particular technology. To minimize cost, providers can choose whichever mix of media they want to underpin a tier, as long as it can support the advertised SLA. As technologies migrate over their S-curve, the storage that underpins a particular tier can change. At the moment, Flash is displacing hard disk drive workloads, and hard disk drives are displacing tape workloads. A technology has to remain competitive in order to avoid having its share of the market eaten by other technologies, both new and old. Mature technologies will find this increasingly difficult. However, tier virtualization also presents a very unique opportunity to bootstrap a new technology. In order for a technology to reach takeoff, it needs sufficient demand to generate the production volumes necessary to drive down per unit costs and make it commodity priced. In the past, storage technologies would often have to generate this demand and drive up volume in the consumer space in order to be successful. However, cloud providers have this demand already. Individually, each of these tiers is enormous at cloud scale and has sufficient demand to drive the per unit manufacturing costs of a new storage technology down. Providers can transparently deploy new technologies to underpin existing tiers and generate enough demand and volume to commoditize the technology. For cold archival storage, a provider can transparently deploy a new technology like silica or DNA alongside tape, for example. Or they could even offer a new tier that's underpinned by a completely new technology. So if we're going to design a new storage technology specifically for the cloud, how should we do it? Now, one very important aspect of this is maximizing the utilization of every component in the system while maintaining the flexibility and reconfigurability needed to meet the workload demands. The cost of any underutilized resources has to be absorbed by the cloud provider. And one mechanism for achieving this is disaggregation. Now, when I say disaggregation, most people think of infrastructure disaggregation. Storage racks that are physically separate from your compute nodes and storage is accessed over a data center network. Now, while this lets you multiplex your storage across many workloads, it relies on many expensive general purpose storage servers that do nothing but service IOs. The ratio of CPU and memory to storage is fixed, and as workloads evolve in data ages, these resources can start to become underutilized. To reduce the number of servers in a storage rack at MSR Cambridge, we've experimented and shipped disaggregated designs at the rack scale. In this design, you have a small number of storage servers and drives that are disaggregated into dynamically configurable resource pools. This lets you scale the amount of CPU and memory resources needed to right size to the workload at any given time. Now, while this is great for adapting to evolving workloads, it does not reduce wastage inside the individual storage devices. The form factor and mechanical design of hard disk drives has led to a decrease in the IOPS in the IO density, that is the IOPS per terabyte over time, and this problem will only get worse as density increases. To meet IOPS requirements, providers have to buy more hard disk drives, resulting in stranded capacity that's not accessible at the same I.O. rates in each unit. The fundamental problem here is that the integrated form factor means that you cannot scale I.O. rates separately from the media. We believe that a cloud-first storage technology should be designed to be fully disaggregated. That is, every resource and functionality across both the hardware and the software stacks should be designed to enable elasticity and maximize utilization without sacrificing maintainability. This lets us also right-size the storage stack processing. We can use exactly the right amount and type of silicone that we need for both the write and the read stacks. We can move these uh, near the hardware, if it makes sense, and we can even specialize them. So we can have low power custom ASICs, for example, or machine learning accelerators, depending on the type of processing that we need. In fact, we're working on a technology to replace hard disk drives that could provide the ability to scale IO rates independent of the media. So one might say, is it worth it? But remember that at cloud scale, every inefficiency adds up. When you're running hundreds of data centers, even a 5% improvement will translate into millions of dollars worth of savings. So we believe full disaggregation is key to being able to keep up with exponentially growing uh, storage demands effectively. Now, another important aspect is embracing form factor freedom. Cloud-first storage technologies don't need to emulate. In fact, they shouldn't emulate existing hardware form factors or software interfaces. In the consumer space, form factor compatibility was very important, but in the cloud, this is not the case. Equipment deployment is done at rack level, and the only constraints that matter are that the racks have to fit within the data center's loading docks, as well as the power budget of the data center. 
A cautionary tale for this are tape libraries. Their mechanical and system design is inefficient and prone to failures. For some workloads, tape drives can have abysmal utilization rates, spending most of their time uh, spooling tapes and waiting for robots to load and unload them rather than actually performing useful I.O. A cloud storage technology should not cling to antiquated designs and compromises that were made from deploying the technology in many different settings. Co-designing the hardware and software also means that you can more easily design for tail latency, which is very important as providers have very little insight into customer workloads and storage tiers need to be provisioned for the 99th percentile. Current approaches are mostly software-based and are at the mercy of whatever information the software device chooses to expose. Disaggregating the storage compute, for example, the compute necessary to decode the data that you read from the media to general purpose hardware also allows the software to ride the compute hardware trends as new hardware is deployed to the data center, which means that over time you get to reduce your costs and improve efficiency. Finally, sustainability is also a very important concern, particularly for media uh, storing long-lived archival data, and I urge you to read our paper for more details on that. So today, cloud storage is poised for disruption. But what about tomorrow? In the cold storage space, we believe that tape is likely to be displaced by silica in the near term, as glass offers a very environmentally resilient long-term media without bit rot. And in the long term, DNA can offer very high data densities, provided that the correct storage system can be built to leverage these media properties. Hard disk drives could be further displaced by flash, or even perhaps by a different technology that's not mainstream. For instance, could an old technology like holographic storage maybe become relevant in the cloud era? In the flash space, several persistent memory technologies have been proposed over the years, with the current front runner being 3D Crosspoint. However, byte addressable persistence can be built at cloud scale using batteries, DRAM, and flash. And with Crosspoint offering much lower densities than flash and worse latencies than DRAM, it's unclear how the current strategy of replacing those two technologies will pan out. Of course, it's also possible that something completely new that we have not yet even considered is the future. So to conclude, cloud storage technology should avoid drop-in replacement emulation. The goal should not be to transparently replace existing media or slot into some existing interface. It should be to build a cloud-only storage system that fully exploits the fundamental capabilities of the media. We should embrace clean slate hardware software co-design from the materials level up, as we believe this is key to building a technology that can cope with the exponential growth that we're seeing in the cloud. Finally, we believe that multidisciplinary teams are very important. Traditionally, research groups tend to work separately under different layers. Physics groups tend to work on the new media, EE groups will design the packaging like memory controllers, and CS groups will build the software stacks. And the problem is this isolation can lead to emulation approaches where separate layers are individually optimized without consideration for the end-to-end -end goals of the entire storage system, which is the most important thing in the cloud setting. On Project Silica, for instance, where I'm currently working, we have a mix of physicists, chemists, optical scientists, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, designers, as well as computer scientists. Breaking communication barriers isn't always easy, but by leveraging and combining the strengths of each of these fields, we've been able to progress much quicker and come up with much more creative solutions to the hard technical challenges that we're facing. We believe that if there is to be a disruption in the cloud storage space in the next decade, then this community should be at its forefront. And we invite you to join us in thinking about and working on all of these challenges. I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Andromaki hatsilov Tegu, Dushan Nagayanan, Ben Thompson, and Ant Rostren. Uh, I'd like to thank you for watching, and I encourage you to please read our paper, and feel free to get in touch if you have any follow-ups or questions or comments. Thank you.